Six out of ten Republicans recommend FTR Radio to everyone they know. The other four are rhinos. FTR Radio. Online at FTRRadio.com. FTR Radio salutes some of the great Democrat presidents in the radio era. FTR Radio. You're listening to Liz and Taylor. All right, so why can't I get another tattoo? Come on. Because you get another tattoo, then you start talking another gun. But not the movie star. The battling duo from the right war on FTR Radio. Oh, come on. You're the one who said it. That was a joke. Partially. (laughs) Enlist in the right war. Won't cost you nothing. Not as good as military service. But it's got to count for something, right? Good evening, folks. Thank you for listening to FTR Radio. I'm Liz Harrison. This is The Right War, and yet again, no Taylor. I I think he's left me. They're they're starting a thing. uh, I think there's a hashtag. (laughs) And you're stuck. Where is Taylor? And you're stuck with me again. Uh, No, actually, you know, that's not like something I'd call stuck with. (laughs) And, And rumor has it, one of your buddies is going to be slumming around here next Wednesday. Who is that? Let me guess. Wait, no, I have no guesses. Unless it's Ash. No. Who is it then? Matthew. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. I know a lot of Matthews. <laughs> Matthew Hurt. Oh, Matt Hurt? Oh, yeah? Yeah. What's he What's he coming on for? Um, He's being Taylor because oh, Taylor's he... gone. You know, oh, he, wow. He disappeared. Where's Taylor? Uh, Matt's a good guy. I, I know him as Matt, not Matthew. And I know he always goes by Matthew, but I don't. Yeah. So <laughs> you have to be different. Yeah, have to be different. Matt's a good guy. He's an outstanding writer, and uh, we worked together for a little while. And uh, I have nothing but good things to say about him. So he'll he'll do well. He's got a like probably one of the most uh, impressive personalities that I've ever encountered. Um, oh so. well, yeah, we've had we've had him before. Uh, right, I was going right. through the archives, and this is like predating when you have been here every Thursday. Uh, we went and really did a bang-up job. It was like boom, 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 straight in a row. Don't ask me what the order was, because I don't remember now. But And the, the episodes are temporarily gone, because they're getting archived. Ah. But it was you, Matt, Jackie, and Julie Borowski. In, like, that order? Something like that. It, it, you four were just all together. Not sure exactly what the order was, but you four were just boom, 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 boom. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah, that's wasn't a, it? Yeah. Uh, it's, that sounds a lot. Actually, it's, like, a really good lineup, like, going back to back to back. Julie's, uh, I don't know if you heard, Julie's out doing her own thing now. She left Freedom Works this week and is starting her own, her own uh, thing on her own. And, uh... It's looking like it's going to be something really interesting. She's going to be doing a lot more videos and stuff. So, um, Oh, that's cool. You probably should have her. Maybe one day have her on to talk about it because I know she's really excited about it. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Yeah, I so, wondered when she was going to spread her wings. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I mean, I know she's, she's, she's felt like, I guess it was, she felt like it was time to, to spread her wings, I guess, and uh, start doing more stuff and making more videos and, um, you know, and and this is I don't say this as a negative, uh, but when you work at a nonprofit like Freedom Works, you're you're not restricted on things you can say, but you have to you don't want to take positions on stuff that are outside of the institution. Um, and they have given us uh, Julie and myself in particular tremendous leeway to to take is- to take positions on issues that are kind of outside of our issue set. Um, but uh, still, you can't talk. I mean, you can't you have to be careful not to weigh too much into politics and talk policy and things like that. So it's, um, you want to be, you gotta be really careful, but, uh, you know, she's, she's doing something that she loves to do. And I think everybody, uh, everybody I've talked to at freedom works is super happy for and hopes and wishes her the best. I know I certainly do. I mean, she, if anybody can do this, 
um, do this on their own and survive on it and raise their profile, it's going to be Julie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And believe me, I know the drill when it comes to the nonprofit deal. Because, you yeah. know, I, I used to run one of those right. things. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it's it's something I've had to be really careful with because, um, it, you know, the with the, well, I mean, everybody everybody who works at a nonprofit has to be really careful with it and not, not just myself in particular, but... Um, you know, with the, the I don't know if you've heard, but the Justice Department's going to be cracking down on uh, nonprofits, and it's just a matter of time before uh, a nonprofit is accused of doing something like campaign coordination, and the 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 brown shirts and the DOJ come stomping into some conservative organization's nonprofit uh, uh, headquarters and demand to, to see their files and take their computers and all that stuff, just because that's what they do. I mean, it's the it's basically the the new, more blatant. Gestapo. Version. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, but it's a more blatant version of the IRS uh, uh, targeting. It's just going to be under the guise of you know we oh, we're, we want to make sure you're not coordinating with a campaign. And of course, um, you know, FreedomWorks doesn't do that, and I don't know of any organization who does it. I mean, everybody takes great strides to avoid avoid anything like that, um, right? Because nobody wants to put an entire organization an organization at risk, um, you know, uh, because of something stupid like that. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, what you so. think about it. It's, it's one of those things where it's like the whole team. If, you know, if, uh, you know, bases loaded two outs in balls hit straight to the shortstop, he bobbles it, run scores game over everybody, you know, everybody on your team loses and nobody wants, nobody wants that. No, no. And, and that said, I'm going to go and say it because we're not doing the whole Taylor disclaimer because there is no Taylor. So we'll do the Jason disclaimer. <laughs> Jason is here on FTR, not talking on behalf of Freedom Works, but on it, on behalf of himself. And he does not endorse any candidate or uh, party or anything else like that. He just likes to snark on them. Yes, I fun. do. Yes, I do. <laughs> and, I, and everything Liz said is correct. And I actually um, have... You know, I've been put in a couple positions, especially since the more presidential campaigns have have really started to heat up. Where I've been asked about the race, and I'm like, they're all, you know, we're, you know, before Rubio got in, it was Ted Cruz and Rand Paul. It's just like, look, they're both good candidates, and you know, uh, tried to throw them both bones. And last week, I even questioned some of the things Paul's been doing, and um, you know, but we you know, shaping up. And regardless, and, and just on that note, regardless of how you feel about the the campaigns and who's going to run, we actually do have a pretty, a pretty wide and pretty, uh, engaging, um, uh, you know, but, you know, group of candidates who are looking at running. So I'm me, you know, I'm pretty excited about seeing what's out there. And, um, with, uh, you know, Fre- freedom works is not going to, we, we actually just today launched a new pack. Um, but we're, we're not going to endorse in any, uh, President, we're not going to endorse any presidential campaigns, but we're going to analyze the campaigns and analyze or analyze the excuse me, not the campaigns, but the uh, the candidates uh, on the issues in our issue set. And uh, our goal is to uh, on federal races like uh, House and Senate to uh, raise money and bundle campaign contributions to uh, to these candidates. So, um, you know, we're looking for defenders of liberty out there. So if you know of one running for House or Senate please share that information with me. We'd love to take a look at them and interview them and, um, you know, see, see where it goes from there. Yeah. Because, uh, just so we're clear here, a lot of people don't necessarily understand the whole PAC thing, right, especially right. where it's related to nonprofit organizations. Well, this is, this is a separate, uh, freedom works PAC is a separate entity. It is not, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not freedom works. Um, right. Right. So um, uh, this is a pack. This is for political purposes, not policy purposes. But we will be looking at policy and uh, uh, you know endorsing candidates and bundling money for them. So right, yeah. He goes a step farther than I used to go, which basically I used to go and help fund lobbyists that were issue issue lobbyists, which freedom works as a nonprofit can theoretically do as long as it's a very low percentage of their actual operating budget. Right. Right. And we can like, 
I think we can uh, do 90 oh, percent. God, I can't remember all the, the funding. I, I actually had the family of organizations chart in front of me. I'm just, just way up there and I can't read it. But I think uh, it's something like 90 percent uh, policy with the with the Freedom Works Incorporated and like 10 percent political or something like that. And then, yeah, it's, uh, it used to be around 9 percent that we were allowed yeah. to throw at lobbying, which, of course, I was lobbying against No Child Left Behind, which made me, you know, evil. <laughs> <laughs> why, do you hate the, why do you hate the children, Liz? Um, I don't hate the children, uh, and No Child Left Behind was ass backwards and would not resolve the issue, and it gave us the bastard child known as Common Core. Well, that's true. I mean, I'm, and I'm not, and, and they're both, they're both uh, spawn of uh, the Bushes, uh, yes. George and, and Jeb. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I I'm particularly like cautious when somebody says it's for the children. Like, yeah. You know, you know, it's. I mean, it's not. It's. It, I don't want to say it's a blanket rule that if somebody says that it's it's a bad thing because there are some cases where it is legitimate. But and and if you pass a law and your and your your big argument is it's for the kids, yeah, I it's probably a bad idea. Not exclusively, but probably. Yeah, there, there's one law that I have been harping on our lawmakers periodically to do, which is for the children. And it's one of those that is actually a good thing. And this one is what has jokingly been referred to as either the Dr. Phil or the Oprah law. Dr. Phil or Oprah? Oh, God, this can't end well. <laughs> actually, it can um, this is uh, this is one that resolves an issue that we have here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and I think it is uh, common to other states. I, d I haven't looked into their laws. But unfortunately here, when you have children who are victims of emotional abuse mm -hmm. um, and mental abuse, you know, you have mentally and emotionally abusive people around them, they mu this must be diagnosed by a psychiatrist for it to stand up in court. Oh, okay. Meanwhile, you have an entire cottage industry. Thank you, Oprah and Dr. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's called that. Uh, that basically there's, there are just piles and piles of books out there that have really legitimately described exactly what these psychiatrists would be diagnosing. And the teachers are actually taught in our in our uh, schools how to recognize it but yet they can't they can report it but their report is meaningless until it's diagnosed and the problem is that most of the time either a the children never end up with a psychiatrist to get the diagnosis in the first place or the psychiatrist won't give the diagnosis even though it's obvious Oh, wow. To all concerned because of liability issues. <laughs> yeah. Of course, we're sitting in the Commonwealth where you can arguably end up beating your child to the point of leaving welts and possibly not end up with child abuse charges. Oh, my God. Really? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a very, very screwed up law, and most of it is hung up on the concept that our legislators, meaning well, sat there and said that only very high-level professionals would be able to diagnose specific forms of abuse. <laughs> and, of wow. course, they did this to avoid litigation, and it did not occur to them, I suppose, that the professionals that they were charging to do this would also be concerned about litigation and their um, malpractice insurance carriers would warn them against doing what the state legislature was telling them to do. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, it's just a huge mess and it, it's just really ridiculous and uh, I, I don't know if I'll go and pick it up again. It's one of those things that is really, really horrible, nasty, it just rips you apart to go and deal with it because when when we would go and have anybody lobby for this, obviously we would be taking cases to the legislators to show them why this is wrong 
So that means that you'd have to sit there and talk to these families and these children, and it is just absolutely horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, you, 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 you are just an emotional basket case afterwards. Right. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, it's, it's hard. You know, you're talking about emotion, emotional basket cases and, and lobbying legislators. Today, um, uh, it, since we're on the topic of for the children and things like that, um, you know, Georgia today, uh, the governor signed a um, uh, medical marijuana bill in the law. Uh, to that I mean, it's not per, it's not a perfect bill, but it's a good enough bill. Um, and the governor apparently, Governor Deal, uh, tried to fight back tears uh, as he was uh, signing the bill in the law, giving a short speech on 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 the, on the bill. And uh, we've had instances in which, um, you know, residents of the state have had to move to Colorado where medicinal marijuana, obviously recreational marijuana is legal, but you can possess cannabis oil, which is what we're talking about. We're not talking about actual joints here. We're talking about uh, cannabis oil, which contains a very low amount of THC, which is the chemical that actually gets you high. Um, and... Uh, the, the state representative who sponsored the bill, his name's Alan Peake, and he's from middle Georgia. I'm actually not – I like him personally, but I'm not a big fan of his um, – a lot of his, the policies he pushes. But this is an issue which – he's ordinarily a nanny state guy and passes all sorts of bills to restrict personal freedom and – or supports bills to restrict personal freedom. But this is the first one I've ever seen him do, and I was like, oh, my God, you're actually – like, you're actually doing this. You're actually doing something right. Like, I can – I can't – I can't yell at you right now, you know? Um, and, um, I actually heard one of these families speak, uh, back in, uh, I think January or February, the father who they have, they had already lost one or two of their children. And he spoke to a local group out here in my neck of the woods. And, um, you know, he, the guy's been trying to save another one of his uh, children who has multiple seizures every day, but the cannabis oil has, has kept the the seizures and seizures in check. And now she just has, I think one or two a week or something like that. And, uh, but his family is, is in large part out in Colorado. His wife is, and he spends a lot of time there. And, uh, when the bill was signed today into law, the state legislator, Alan Peak um, turned to the families, uh, that were there and, and, you know, and according to the article proclaimed, you can come home now. And, uh, I got the feels when I, when I read that today, like about an hour before we came on, just, it really touched my heart. I'm just like government generally does things very bad, but they actually did something right. And, um, it was for the children, you know, in a lot of ways. And this is one of those instances in which, you know, the, for the children argument actually was a good thing. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> You're going to play Forrest Gump. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm saying, and, and you don't, I mean, I, I don't, I really don't get the feels that often about stuff like this, but I mean, I'm sitting here talking about this. I'm actually fighting back tears because I've actually met this fam, one of the families that has had to, to deal with this. And, uh, it was a huge hurdle, um, for them to climb or jump. And, you know, it did took a, it was a hard fought victory, but you know, they got it done. And, yeah. uh, and, and the legislative, the Georgia general assembly got it done. It was a, terrible session in terms of uh you know tax hikes on taxpayers and you know the legislature even tried to push through a bill that would restrict organizations like freedom works and others from you know weighing in on policy issues in georgia but uh this was that bill was killed thankfully but this one bill hb1 the medicinal marijuana law um it, you know, it was the one good thing that happened this year. So I'm very happy about that. So, and it's a good, it's a, like I said, it makes me a little emotional, but it's a good kind of emotional. I can understand that. I, I might be in the same boat with you some point in the future. Cause, uh, yeah, I got out of doing the political campaigns, but I, for candidates, but, um, I got myself sort of hung on to the idea of dealing with an immigration issue. Right. I don't know where it's going to go because honestly, it's sitting there. It, it's like they're, it, it's a bill looking for sponsors. And Rubio had been a logical one, and that sort of kind of went out the window. Yeah. So, well. yeah. So, we, I, I don't know where they're going to go at this point with it. 
since we don't have the possibility of really talking to Rubio, uh, what it was was a, essentially a Family Unity Act, which, because of the two-way street of it, would actually end up helping somebody from the FTR family, namely Katrina Jorgensen. Right. We've talked about that before, right? Yeah. But the other end of it is one that affects families here in the Pittsburgh region. And they are not residents here. They are not citizens. These are families that come to the states, specifically to the Pittsburgh region, for um, medical treatment for their children at Pittsburgh's Children's Hospital. And it runs in... It runs in little spurts here and there, but it's it, so it's not necessarily a constant problem. But periodically, we have the hospital going and bringing neglect or some other like medical neglect charges against parents who want to take their children back when it, it, their situation, their medical situation no longer requires the highly specialized care that they get here in Pittsburgh. In other words, they're well enough along that they could go back to where they came from. The medical facilities where they came from are sufficient. And the hospital fights and says, no, it's not. They basically lie, and they end up getting these children turned into wards of the state with the hospital or some member of the hospital legal staff as their guardian ad litem. Okay. So basically it's essentially the hospital sitting there and grabbing custody of these children from their parents. And then they go and get the parents deported. Oh, wow. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I, have we, and that have was we, brought to my attention by family members who had volunteered at, of all places, the Ronald McDonald House. Oh, wow. <laughs> they would find these families there, and they, they, like, they'd be there one week and gone the next, and you'd ask, and they'd say, oh, they were deported. What about their kid? The kid's still in the hospital. Jeez. <laughs> so, yeah, it... it it is. I, I I was totally furious because I'm sitting here, you know, talking, breathing, etc., because of Children's Hospital. I would not be here now if it wasn't for that facility. So it in, it, it totally infuriates me because I can't sit here and say I am all for the place that saved my life because they do this. Yeah. And that that just totally pushed me over the edge. And at first, I had been hesitant to go and involve myself in it. And then they started saying, well, it was brought to our attention that the bill may be more palatable, quote unquote, if it went the other direction. In other words, easing the, like greasing the wheels for individuals who have family members, like a husband. Yeah, right. (laughs) Who has been put in the limbo of our legal immigration system to expedite them the way they're supposed to be because you know you go and look at the immigration sites and they sit there from the government and it sits there and says they're supposed to be at the front of the line right they rarely are right i know we've had you and i have had some some passionate discussions about immigration but i mean i i I don't know if i've ever told the story about the this the family that my mother was involved with um it was a uh, she taught uh, ESOL, which is English English speakers of other languages, uh, in um, middle school. She taught elementary school kids and middle school kids um, uh, this this class, this subject, and uh, she it's basically English English. I can't even see. I can't even pronounce it. English as a second language. Um, maybe I need to take ESOL. Um, but uh, she got in, involved with this family. Um, one of her students who um they were they were illegal immigrants that came in from Mexico and I say were because they're legal now but they were illegal and the daughter had had gotten in some um some trouble it was the it was a, a father of uh two daughters oh, excuse me a stepfather two daughters and a mother and um uh some, some stuff had happened and um uh, turns out the the poor girl was was raped by her father um and I believe 
believe gave birth to a child that was his uh, and the stepfather stepfathers and my mom uh, you know pushed um Basically, well, drove them around basically at risk to herself because Georgia had passed one of those uh, Arizona style uh, anti immigration bills and, uh, you know, took it upon herself. And she was a hardcore immigration restrictionist before all this stuff happened. And once she got to see and meet some of these kids in her class, because roughly a, a third to half of the classes that she taught were, were um, presumed illegal immigrants. And, um, uh, she never asked, obviously. I don't think she could do that. But, um, yeah, but it's just it's one of those sad, sad situations. It takes an experience. It takes knowing someone such as uh, Katrina or, uh, in my mother's case, a student, and to really kind of see um, how broken the system really is, regardless of whether you're considering it, you know, a situation like this, like the one you mentioned, or another situation um, that my mother saw that – how how truly 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 screwed up it is right yeah anyway. uh, it's just uh, it's a mess no matter which way you cut it yeah uh, i mean it is I, what what bothers me uh, i mean we've given up a lot of things whenever it comes to immigration we have a lot of immigration problems now thanks to 9-11 and the knee-jerk response that we had in the administration, and arguably it's made us less safe. And that's the irony. Well, I mean, I... Because, I don't no, wanna... when you have all of these people who are sneaking across the border, quote-unquote, the it's not like it used to be. Well, we it... arguably knew, like, the border, border Patrol arguably knew more about the people who were, even though there were so many of them, it was even down to the point where they could at least, you know, recognize the face in the crowd, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, it's one when of those you things. you had the migrant workers crossing the border. Right. But we also have to remember that, you know, roughly 40 to 45 percent of people who are in the country illegally come, come are here on expired visas. This is not a solely a border, uh, a border issue. It's right. part, that's a that's a big part of the issue, but it's not solely a border issue. And I still would submit at risk of getting into a, another debate about immigration. Um, th- Cause I know we have a couple other topics that we want to cover, but I mean, I would submit to you that the reason we have such a bad, uh, such a, such a big immig- uh, illegal immigration problem is because the immigration reform or immigration laws in this country are just horribly broken to the point of uh, it encourages illegal immigration. Um, and you can build walls all you want to. Um, but, I don't think walls keep people out. They're going to find a way in regardless of what you do until the system is fixed. Yeah. That, but that's just my, that's my two cents. And, if, and I think I've mentioned this before, but there's a great Penn and Teller video uh, out there from their TV show uh, in which they, they hired a bunch of illegal immigrants to come build a, a mock-up of the fence that was going to be built at the Southern border. And the immigrants took about three to six minutes to get through. Like right. completely dismantled. Yeah, I mean, they, they cut the barbed wire, they dug holes underneath it, and, and just large enough for them to get, to get through the, 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 the fence. So, I mean, I really don't think a wall, a border, uh, this, this fence is going to fix anything. So, No, um, no, no. And, and has... honestly, we've reached the point in technology where, you know, welcome to, I, I mean, there are sections of the open border in Texas where thanks to residents, if the government wished to know, it could even be down to a matter of just linking up to personal home security systems. Sure. To be able to see on video people crossing the border. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean, that's, I'm sure that's true. I mean... Um, uh, uh, that was ABC that went and oh, did no, I, They I, did I, I a 2020 yeah, I, thing on it, and it was years I ago. I don't doubt you at all. I don't doubt you at all. I'm, like I said, I'm sure that's true. I'm just – I mean it's just a uh, situation – I mean I don't know. It, it's, I, I'm not discounting that, that people are coming in illegally, especially in open sections of the border in Texas or in other parts of the, the southwest. I don't doubt that. Um, but I think you have to look at the root cause, and the root cause uh, is, in my opinion – well, it's there are a couple of things, but the the major part of it is um, uh, just bad immigration laws that encourage it. But there are other ancillary things, such as people. I mean, one of the things is America, whether 
I know we're kind of down about the economy and we have been for years because it's been a very slow recovery and even, and there are even some signs lately that the economy may be potentially contracting again, which is definitely a bad thing. But, um, but no, it's uh, even despite all the problems we've had with our economy over the last six to seven years, um, America is still the economic power of the world. And there are people who do want to come here and, and provide a better life for themselves and their families, whether they're, they bring their families with them or send money back home. Um, and yeah, I, it's one of those things I don't, I, I don't have, we can talk all day and we can debate all day about people who come here illegally and, uh, you know, but I, I have a hard time saying someone who wants to better themselves or make a better life for their families, uh, can't come here. Um, especially with the system as broken as it is. Now, Mike in the chat room went and said that a wall works just fine in uh, Israel. Actually, no. Um, they have issues with tunnels. They have issues with um, falsified papers. They have issues with just all manner of different ways that Palestinians end up getting into Israel with weaponry and attack. So... <sighs> That's... I hardly, I hardly think that someone coming across a border, uh, shooting them, is. I hardly think that's just justification. Like you, no, I'm sorry, no. My my cousin had that job. It was called Berlin. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see why you anyone would ever suggest that. That's that's not a that's insane. I'm sorry. I don't mean to insult anyone, but that's insane. Right. I mean, uh, one, of, one of the bigger problems, the reason why we have a lot of this beyond the migrant worker issue of no longer being able to do things the way we had pre-9-11 is our ridiculous war on drugs. <laughs> uh, that's another aspect of it. Um, you know, <laughs> and I remember back a few years ago, uh, it's probably been 10 years ago now, and I'm, sh- I'm sure there are you can Google it and find articles on it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Vicente Fox and his administration were, were prepared to p- push um, decriminalization through uh, in, in Mexico. And uh, the Bush administration lobbied them hard to kill it. See, yeah. I, I don't get it because if you, if you remove the criminal nature of the activity... Yes, you will still have an underground, uh, I mean, case in point, you still have moonshiners here in the United States. We even have a show about it. But it will severely lessen it. It will radically decrease their operation. And if you do it right, so I, I'm not a, I, I keep on saying I'm a proponent for legalizing all the things, but... <laughs> I, I'm smart enough to realize there has to there have to be guinea pigs. Colorado yeah. is a guinea pig right now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Watch what they're doing, watch their missteps, and take notes and avoid them. No, I mean it absolutely is. I mean, and you know that's one of those. It's and I'm I'm not an advocate. I am an I don't advocate for drug drug legalization. Um, I do think marijuana should be legal. I've never smoked it. I have no in, desire to smoke it um um but it's one of those things that i think if i mean you look at the you look at federal and i've I've spent a lot of time reviewing the number of people who are locked up in federal penitentiaries um and it most of them are i think in the statistics i saw i mean you're looking at roughly half if not more than half of all prisoners locked up in federal penitentiaries are there for marijuana uh, excuse me, of all those who are uh, locked up for drug-related crimes are there for marijuana. Uh, most of them are nonviolent, uh, like something like 49 to 0.6%, roughly 50%. In 2012, it was 53%. I mean, we're putting away people in jail for people who weren't even, who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are cases like that where people who, who uh, didn't want to be where they were, uh, 
we're, we're wanting to get home. There was an instance of a, a girl who was at her boyfriend's house. Her boyfriend was a drug dealer. He was making a deal. She wanted to go home because he was making the deal. He said he would take her home after it was done. He sold to an undercover cop. She went to jail, and she was prosecuted under mandatory minimums. Right. I mean, you know, there's a it's, – it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. There's a Weldon Angelos who's a – I can't remember where he was from. I want to say from California. He, he – um, this guy sold a relatively – I don't remember how much, but he he made three drug deals to a uh, an undercover cop. Um, he had uh, he did not. I'm saying that he did not brandish the firearm, but he had a firearm in his possession. But he was right. prosecuted prosecuted under mandatory minimums and sentenced to 55 years in jail. Rapists don't get 55 years in jail, right? And the the judge even said it when he was sentencing him. You don't deserve this, but I have to give you the sentence because the law mandates it. Well, I'm I'm loving the whole mandatory minimums thing because uh, that that apparently is not necessarily the law of the land whenever you're in California. Uh, well, we ha- we had a case there that there was a man, and it had to do with rape, of course. He sodomized a three year old girl. Wow! And the judge reduced the reduced the mandatory minimum. <laughs> Significantly so. I, I think he got five years instead of 20. Oh, well, and see, his logic was because he did not cause any significant physical harm to the child uh, in doing the act. Because, you, you know, typically this will cause physical harm. Yeah, he didn't intend to hurt the child. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, um, did it ever occur to you that sex crimes are not just physical no absolutely not and and um i won't i'm not gonna say whom but i mean there's a family member of mine who who was abused as as a child and it has literally stuck with her her entire life she can't it has it has affected everything about her um and you know that i see because i i understand the arguments for mandatory minimums for some crimes for like this in this instance because it's a crime against a person it's a crime against you know you're you're committing a, an act you're harming someone you're infringing on their liberty i don't know that i have a problem with those with those yeah i i don't I, I don't either on sex crimes i, there, I there, definitely there, don't well no i and I, I don't know that i do either i mean it, it's it's one of those things that um and then there are some organizations out there, and and I think they make some really compelling arguments. I just don't know that I agree with them all, and, and they're against mandatory minimums entirely for any crime, and and well, if not for any crime, for like obviously for murder and things like that. They're, I mean, I assume they support them. I haven't looked that far into detail, but it's mostly drug related crimes. Um, yeah, and I understand I understand some of those arguments, but when when you it's it's the drug crimes that I have. Like if you're if you're not committing a violent act, if you're not brandishing a weapon, if you're not um, if you're not a ringleader in a um, in a drug ring, you know, and and that's the thing. Like ringleaders are more likely to cut deals to get uh, to escape mandatory minimums. Right. Low level low level offenders, they don't no. have that sort of intelligence. They can't cut deals. They can't sell anybody out. To, right. to to reduce their sentence, they're the ones who are more likely to go to prison under mandatory minimums. Right, and I don't know. The it, little fish get the big punishment, and the big fish get away. Yep, they do. I mean, they, the big fish may serve some time or have some, but they don't serve generally mandatory minimums because they can they can always they always have something to share to get themselves out of it. And it's now, just it's an incredibly screwed up situation. Now, but, like this is all downer and and all of that, so. We're going to go with something funny, because we were talking about it before we came on air. Oh, yeah. Al Sharpton. <laughs> Good old Al. Yeah. he He's <laughs> upset because, you know, Loretta Lynch is sitting by the wayside. I thought primarily. you were going to say he's upset because yeah, he has a head that's too big for his body. <laughs> There's that, too. He, he used to be a much bigger man, I remember. <laughs> It was more proportional then. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. 
you know, in the good old days when he was, you know, pimping Tawana Brawley. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I I'm, I'm a Morton Downey that. Jr. fan. What do you want? I mean, Mort, Mort went and took the fall for the bastard. <laughs> so, yeah, basically it's, you know, a, a very nasty situation. I, I, I hate him for that. I really do. I, I mean, we, we people sit there and they're like, oh, Rush Limbaugh this, Rush Limbaugh that. He revolutionized everything. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But Rush sort of kind of went the route of Mort to rocket that direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mort was the one who started it. Mort gave us Rush Limbaugh and Howard Stern. <laughs> or better or worse. Morton Downey Jr. is the reason why we have both of them. Talk about being a real source of inspiration in the world of media. But yeah, there it is. Uh, anybody doubts it, go and try to look them up on the YouTube. There are plenty of clips, etc. But, uh, yeah, Al Sharpton is upset. Loretta Lynch is not getting her thing. She's not being uh, approved. Not that she should be because of the whole civil asset forfeiture Well, civil thing. asset forfeiture, uh, the NS... That alone, the, yeah, that that alone is enough, but of course there's a whole bunch of other crap too. Right, so, so the three main ones, civil asset forfeiture, uh, her support of NSA, domestic surveillance, domestic spying, and uh, uh, going back to our previous conversation, although we won't dive right back into it, her support of um, uh, basically unchecked uh, administrative actions on... Uh, yeah, in general, especially on immigration. Right. Yeah, basically she's... We we wondered, okay, is it possible to get worse than Eric Holder? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it she is. is it. She is it, absolutely. Without so, a doubt. Uh, yeah, Al Sharpton's upset because she's been pushed to the back burner yet again. And it, this is because of Obama, of course. Because of Iran. Um, our... Congress is involved in passing legislation to reaffirm congre constitutional powers. There, there's no other way to put that, folks, just so you understand. Uh, I mean, anybody who wants to go and scream, liberals start screaming about, you know, the Republicans talking about, and by the way, it's not just Republicans, it, there is bipartisan support. This uh, went through this flew right through the foreign affairs committee yeah. with a unanimous vote, right. which means that every single Democrat on the committee voted for this. So there, the Democrats that are opposed to it are few and far between Nancy Pelosi, Feinstein, uh, Debbie, what's her name? Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> the only, the only, the only uh, person I've heard even say they don't really have an opinion on the on the deal is Bernie Sanders, who caucuses with the Democrat, although, Democrats, although he's a socialist or an independent, but he's a self-identified socialist. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody else seems, and I have no opinion on the deal because I, I don't really know what's there. But what I have heard is, I mean, what the rumors I've heard, it, it's terrible, but. Yeah, uh, Iran gets everything that they want. We don't get anything that we want. And uh, basically, we have no guarantee that they're going to do anything. And Russia was going to end up getting nuclear material, but they probably wouldn't because, let's be real, if we're dealing with Putin, he'd sit there and say that he did, but he'd probably leave it with them anyway. Because probably. after all, isn't he sitting there hand handing them a missile uh anti-missile system now yeah yeah so yeah but, uh, which uh, means which means by the way in case anybody's wondering we have putin all by himself has increased the probability that israel will make a preemptive strike against iran before they have that defense system that putin is giving them because once they have it Israel's ability to protect itself or strike at all 
against Iran will be extremely diminished. They will yeah. not be able to really do anything of significance against them, nor will anybody else, including the U.S. So, yeah, the, this is a very ugly situation. And, yeah, it's right that the Congress sits there and says, Loretta Lynch, cool your heels. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, this but is, Al Sharpton is saying he's going to do a hunger strike. Let him. But let him. The problem is somebody didn't tell him what a hunger strike <laughs> really is. Because <laughs> apparently they're they're doing it um, as if it were Lent for Catholics, and every day is fri- every other day is Friday. <laughs> oh, Al. <laughs> so they'll be fasting every other day. Now, given how long that all of this might last, if they had actually been doing a real hunger strike, we could have been rid of Al Sharpton. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm endorsing, not that we're endorsing such things. <laughs> the opinions on this, I heard on this show, do not reflect the employers of either person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I was just pointing out a fact, I mean, because they've already said that it could take up to a few weeks. And given Al Sharpton's age and everything else, uh, yeah, I can't see him lasting that long if he really did not eat for that entire period of time. So. No, absolutely not. I mean, it's the of all the hills to die on, um, this is, is not the one. I mean, <laughs> I mean... It, it, I get where they're going. I mean, I get it's everything. Everything is a, <clears throat> a racial issue to them. I get that, and I understand that. This this ain't one of them. I mean, uh, it, it, God forbid that she actually be really, really bad on policy. <laughs> a lot of policies, although different senators have different reasons for opposing her, um, mostly dealing dealing with immigration. Um, but for others, oh no, there's a lot. There's a lot who are opposed to her just over the civil assets. Oh, well, I know, I know. You have bipartisan support to put an end to it. Right, I know, and and it's specifically the only ones. Who, but the only ones I've heard actually point that out are Rand and um, Rand Paul and Mike Lee. Um, Lee actually quizzed her during the Senate confirmation judiciary confirmation hearing. He he quizzed her pretty hard on it and it was actually that testimony that, that got Rand Paul to to come out and say, you know, basically for that reason alone I'll I'll oppose her. But um the uh the civil asset forfeiture stuff is particularly bad and very pernicious. But um at the same time, you know there are, and just going into some other things, there are a lot of other issues and I'm not de- God forbid I defend um I defend uh, uh, Republicans in the Senate because I generally I think they're they're a bunch of squishes who um, have done nothing but pass small ball legislation. Um, they uh, they actually do have a lot of issues, and Iran is 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 obviously one of them. Uh, passing a budget is another one. Um, you know, there, there there are some big things, and I know yesterday, since we were on the topic of civil asset forfeiture, I mean Loretta Lynch, Loretta Lynch is already cleared out of the Senate or, or the Senate Judiciary Committee. Her her confirmation. Has it just hasn't been taken up by the full Senate yet? Um, you know, there was a hearing yesterday on civil asset forfeiture in the in the Senate Judiciary Committee. So there there are a lot of issues and a lot of important issues that they're taking up. But Loretta Lynch is not the only one. And you know, I'm sorry if Eric Holder has to stay in his, his position for another few months while they sort out other big issues. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and shed tears for that. That's not going to happen. And I don't think anybody else should either. And everything is not a racial issue. She just sucks on policy. End of story. Uh, I, I don't know. Basically, um, I, I'm uh, the big thing with uh, Eric Holder is the attitude that was mentioned in one of the articles that I read. Uh <laughs> <laughs> A senator, I think it was, I can't, I can't even remember who it was, but it was priceless. It basically was saying that they really didn't give a damn. <laughs> that anybody was upset that Eric Holder was not allowed to make his exit to get off of the really low pay grade at the government. <laughs> to go make lots of money in the private sector. <laughs> I mean, well... I mean, well, this is filed under, you know, he he's sitting in limbo. You know what my answer to him is? Go set up your um your secondary income 
Yeah. But, you, you know, know, go get ready for your royalty payments. Where's your book, babe? <laughs> well, and, and it's, and I'm not, and I haven't double checked this yet, but, um, uh, and I think we've, I don't know if we talked about this before. I mean, I met, uh, back in, in March, I was, I attended a meeting at the justice department and with, and, um, Eric Holder was there. I also met the deputy attorney general. She is, to my knowledge, has not been confirmed yet either. She was a recess appointment, if I recall. And right. she she is still waiting her confirmation. It ain't just Loretta Lynch. There are others as well who have not been confirmed yet. And the reason they haven't been confirmed yet is because there are other pressing issues that demand Congress's attention. Um, yeah, like Obama trying to make treaties with other nations I mean, unenforceable. really, really batshit stupid. Oh, yeah, unenforceable, unconstitutional treaties at that. Ex- excuse me, executive agreements that have no real force of law and will be undone is you know by if a Republican wins in 2016 is going to oh, do no. it on his I do it on his first day in office. I I wouldn't even just say that it would be a Republican to do it. I mean, God forbid that old Hills makes it in. How much you want to bet that she would too? Things are real. I mean, she has no basic desire. No, she has no basic desire to have any agreement with Iran. Well, I mean, I you know, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, let's let's remember that every foreign, well, not just about every foreign policy decision that she has made has turned out to blow up in her face. Whether it's invading or whether it's a, not invading, but engaging uh, in a war in Libya that in which we had no business to be in. Uh, whether it's the Russian reset, uh, whatever you want to point at, it's been screwed well, up. I mean, I've been it, thinking about all of that. Okay, the whole Libyan thing, that wasn't her choice. That was Obama. Um, she was being pressured by him. The reset maybe, button for Russia was after the hot, hot mic situation with um, Obama, wasn't it? I don't know if it was or not. But I, I think, I, I think you have most to, you of have it to look was at involved it, with that. But you have to look at it as a... It's not just those 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 things you have to go back and look at it th- through the course of of her political history from oh, the time yeah, when she was the first lady it goes back to iraq in the 90s hell it goes back to watergate oh but- <laughs> that's th- those are more broader scandals but yeah i mean i'm just saying that it, this woman has not met a war that she hasn't liked Right, and and so, she hasn't met a lie that she wasn't willing to say. Right, so if she has the opportunity can, to continue what so-called legacy Barack Obama has in terms of this farce of an agreement with with the Iranians, she's probably going to continue it. You, you, she'll she'll probably try to improve it, but she'll definitely try to continue it. Improve it being used loosely. Um, uh, yeah. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if she came out and tried to do something this, you know, to prove her image as a diplomat. Yeah, but she's also really big on money. That's and true. And there are probably a lot of liberal leaning American Jews that realize this. And uh, that's what we need to worry about there. Well, let's go, it's, it'll be interesting to see how she tries to play this one down during the campaign, if she will try to come out as a little bit more of a hawk. Um, I I mean, again, like I said, she has a history of being a hawk, but I I don't think she's going to be on this one. But it's still, I think, I still think it... Oh, no, she's playing the woman card. Well, no, but I'm saying when she actually has to... Well, if the media ever decides to to pressure her, or if her campaign, people let her off the leash and she actually has to give answers for something, it'd be interesting to see what she does. But I do think this is the one instance in which she's going to try to play diplomat. She's going to try to continue negotiate or, or talk about the negotiations and how we should engage. And I don't necessarily think engaging Iran is a is an a bad is a bad idea. I think that we have to be very careful about how we engage them and what the details. Well, of I have a question are. for you on that. Uh, You say that it's not a bad idea to engage with Iran. How about engaging with ISIS? No, I wouldn't engage with ISIS. Uh, There's a maybe you need to rethink your thought on Iran. There's a difference, in my opinion. There's a difference. Uh, Only because one has uh, recognized borders and has been recognized by the UN as a legitimate state, but both have the the same goal. No, well, both. No, both have the same goal. Both one have, Sunni, one Shiite. Right. They both have the same goal. Right. Well, hold on. Iran is has to this point been largely, and I think this is you have to separate what is 
rhetoric for the hardliners and what is reality. Um, a lot of what they say is rhetoric for the hardliners. Um, it, r- rhetoric does mean something. Um, well, especially when it, as it relates to Israel and some of the things they've said in terms of what they would like to do to Israel, which is to wipe it off the mat. So yes, it does mean something. Well, no, I, I, what I'm thinking of is, you know, we've seen that huge uprising by moderate Islam against the radicals. Oh, wait. No, we didn't. <laughs> well, so, I, know we have, I, yeah. know have, I know we have to go here in a minute, but I, I'm just simply saying that, um, and I think you, I think one point, you, you pointed out one point, which is that they are a recognized country. They've been recognized by the UN, um, but they have been largely isolated. They have very few friends, and most of right. the most, if not many, if not most of the Middle Eastern countries want that to stay, want it to stay that way. But I do think we have to be careful if we engage them. We have to be careful with how we engage them. And I'm not a diplomatic expert. I do domestic policy. You're but, right. I do foreign policy. So there but, you go. It's but, unfair. Uh, but uh, but it's we're we're about things. out of time anyway, Jason. So, gotcha. um, of course, follow him at, at Jace Liberty on Twitter and read what he has to say at freedomworks.org and uh, I will be back here next week with his buddy Matt 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 Hurt so thanks for listening have a great night